Thanks, Bonnie. So I'm Kevin Jones. I'm a partner in the firm's energy and infrastructure team. Along with uh, Paul Tiao, I co-chair the firm's uh, energy sector security team, as well as our cyber and physical security task force. We formed those initiatives, uh, which are interdisciplinary in nature, a little over five years ago to work with our energy and other critical infrastructure clients on a range of security issues, including preparedness and risk management, regulatory compliance, Safety Act certification, incident response, stakeholder relations, and related litigation policy and legislative issues. Each of the attorneys on the panel here with us today are members of these groups within the firm. Andrea Gardner is a senior attorney in the firm's energy and infrastructure team. She counsels critical infrastructure clients on a range of regulatory compliance and litigation matters. Susan Wiltsey is a partner in the firm's labor and employment practice, and she advises clients on a range, within a range of industries on labor and employment and OSHA issues, as well as management of contamination and infectious disease within the workplace. Paul Tiao is a partner in the firm's privacy and data security team, and as I noted, he co-chairs the firm's cyber and physical security task force, as well as the energy sector security team. Lori Masters is a partner in the firm's insurance practice. She advises clients on a wide range of insurance coverage and recovery issues across a spectrum of policies. And also joining us uh, today are Dr. Miles Spar, a medical doctor with a master's degree in public health, board certified in internal medicine and integrative medicine. Dr. Spar is an expert in public health, having served as a clinician, researcher, and medical school faculty member. Among other things, he worked for a number of years with the aid organization Doctors Without Borders, first as a field volunteer and then a member of its board of directors. Ashley Koff is a registered dietitian who acts as a practitioner, consultant, and educator in her field. She frequently consults with and appears in national media on a range of diet and healthcare issues and has been recognized as one of the top 10 registered dietitians in the US. The individuals on this panel have worked together and individually on a range of matters related to the current COVID-19 pandemic since the start of the outbreak here in the US. Of particular relevance, we have worked closely as a team advising a number of critical infrastructure companies on preparedness, response, and contingency planning for managing mission-critical workforce throughout this pandemic. So the COVID-19 outbreak is of obvious significance for all businesses, but for critical infrastructure companies and other essential businesses, there are obviously unique considerations. No business wants to shut down, but these businesses really can't shut down. They're essential to continued functioning of our society and the economy, and many of them are directly relevant to efforts to combat the virus itself. There's continuously evolving guidance available from a variety of reputable government and industry sources, and some of it is quite good, uh, but it's also often incomplete when you get down to the details of designing and implementing measures for continued operations of mission critical functions within an organization. This program will focus on measures that critical infrastructure companies can take and that an increasing number of companies are taking to manage workforce risk of exposure to COVID-19 and to help ensure continued availability of personnel trained to perform mission critical functions. Dr. Spar is gonna briefly summarize some of the medical science of the virus and discuss current thinking about the likely course of the outbreak. Ashley Koff will discuss the features and merits of a medically supervised program for addressing COVID-19 within the workforce. And then the panel will discuss at a high level some of the measures that critical infrastructure companies and other essential businesses can implement to help the, reduce the risk of employee exposure to COVID-19, both on and importantly off the job. And we will discuss contingency planning for continued operations through a COVID-19 outbreak within the employee population. We'll also address some of the key legal issues involved, including labor and employment, healthcare, privacy, insurance, and others. As I mentioned, Dr. Spar and Ashley Koff have been the medical and healthcare advisors of this team in our work with clients on COVID-19 planning and response. They have provided really invaluable insights and guidance that you're not gonna get from the lawyers. So with that, I will turn it over to them for their medical perspectives. Thanks, um, Kevin. What I wanna do at this point is introduce Dr. Spar to have him talk about right. the medical science. 
Yes, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry about that. I was saying thank you for distinguishing us from the lawyers. Our, my medical colleagues appreciate that. Um, so it's great to be here, and I'm just going to explain a little bit about the virus and why this is unique and why it's something that is pertinent to have discussions like this and have to worry about. And it, forgive me if many of you know this, and I don't mean to be talking down to anybody, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page and we understand why this is such a significant pandemic to consider um, when you're talking about essential personnel and essential companies. Number one, the main thing to keep in mind is that this virus is very, very unique. Number one, it's unique from the flu virus, um, which some people say, oh, the symptoms are just like the flu. We know it really isn't for several reasons. Number one, this is a completely new novel virus to the human species. Nobody is immune. No one had antibodies to this until the outbreak in China in December. Therefore, nobody is protected and anybody that gets exposed to it is liable to develop an infection and then if they're at higher risk to get very, very sick from it. Number two, um, the spread is much more easily done than even the other SARS viruses. If you recall, the SARS epidemic in 2003 was in fairly isolated areas because it caused people to get very sick very quickly. This virus causes an infection that is then contagious even before any symptoms develop. That's different from the flu, in which case symptoms develop quickly and they're spread quickly for the first few days and then the spread goes down. Even in SARS-1 in 2003, people got very sick quickly. With this virus, there's actually the highest risk of spreading it the first five days after you've been exposed to it when you have the least likelihood of really having symptoms that you would notice. So one way and one thing that you can be thinking about in terms of how to anticipate where it's gonna be happening next is actually starting to look at really mild symptoms that are sounding like the flu. Again, it's a very different virus from the flu, but the first few days potentially could cause achiness, feverishness. And in fact, we're starting to predict where the next hotspots will be by looking at the places the CDC has already set up around the country to recognize influenza-like illnesses, to recognize where people are starting to present to doctors with muscle aches and feverishness, and also by checking temperatures. There's evidence that smart thermometers use has predicted the outbreak of viral illnesses like this one weeks before tests are even done and, and found to be positive. So the key thing is to try and anticipate where this is by some of those very, very mild early symptoms and to recognize that many more people get this virus because it's spread before anyone recognizes they have it. That's why this whole social distancing and early containment is important because even before someone would potentially think about having a test, they could be spreading it. In terms of where we are now with it, I'm sure many people are keeping up with it. Um, but just to remind you, you know, so far there have been about 367,000 cases in the U.S. as of today. There have been about 11,000 deaths in the U.S. That's a, a case fatality rate of about 3%. In New York State, unfortunately, it's the largest hotspot right now. We have about 138,000 cases and we've had close to 5,500 deaths. So similar case fatality rate. Um, actually a little higher, closer to 3.9%. We were thinking it was plateauing here, but the last 24 hours had the highest number of deaths yet. So we haven't quite reached the plateau. And the next highest states are New Jersey, Michigan, Louisiana. Um, and the important factors to consider wherever you are is that number one, if you can get a handle on where some of those early indicators are of high temperature or people presenting with any of these symptoms, that can predict where it's going to be ramping up. But number two, to look at the case, I would say, of Ohio versus Michigan as a great way to show that what we're doing, which is so difficult right now with social distancing, really can work. Because if you look at the numbers, Michigan has four times the cases as Ohio. Ohio implemented stay-at-home orders March 23rd, way before they even had maybe 100 cases or something. So as soon as you have one case, you can assume you have 10 cases. And that brings up the issue of testing and numbers. We know that these numbers we're all seeing are vastly underrepresenting because we don't have enough tests in this country. So the thinking is that there are probably between 10 and 50 times more cases than we know of. Um, we don't therefore know what the true case fatality rate is because we don't know what the denominator is of cases of people who die over the total number of cases. So it's very hard to know, but these numbers are somewhat representative, obviously. But the point is when you even see a couple cases in an area where you're 
responsible for people who are working and companies staying afloat, then as soon as you see a couple, it's already almost too late, but don't wait till you see a couple hundred. And Ohio versus Michigan really shows that. What are the risk factors for people doing really poorly and the risk factors to consider when you're looking at how do you segregate empl essential employees out and protect the ones most vulnerable from really getting very sick? We know it's age, people over 65 are more likely to end up in the hospital and potentially die from this. Obesity, which is a big problem for states where obesity rates are even higher like Louisiana, they will potentially have a higher case fatality rate. High blood pressure, kidney issues, which you might not think is a big deal, but 15% of the population actually has kidney function issues. Smokers and people with chronic pulmonary disease. Smokers are really important. That's probably why most of the deaths, for example, were in men as opposed to women in China, because about 70% of men in China smoke much more than in women. And then people with diabetes and people with a weakened immune system. Really quickly, the clinical course that typically happens, and this is gonna change if you have any of those risk factors, is typically if someone gets this, a good 25 to 50% of the time, they will have no symptoms and have no clue they even have it. But if they do get symptoms, it can be a mild viral-like illness where you feel feverish, maybe a dry cough. And then if you get a serious case of it, what progresses is after the first couple of days of feeling poorly, you start to feel better typically. Then it really becomes fulminant a couple of days later. And you have five to six days of potentially having very serious breathing problems. And that's when the pneumonia can develop. And a few things are happening there. Number one, the pneumonia happens directly from this virus as opposed to influenza, which typically doesn't cause pneumonia, it causes more upper respiratory nasal symptoms and can proceed a bacterial pneumonia in the lungs. This pneumonia that is caused by this virus is directly from the virus, which then brings on this giant fulminant inflammatory response from the body trying to get rid of the virus that causes what's called a cytokine storm you might've heard about, that causes a lot of fluid in the lungs and makes it unable to breathe without a ventilator oftentimes for several weeks and high amounts of oxygen. That's why you keep hearing about ventilators. That's why you keep hearing about running out of those because a high proportion of people who get pneumonia require ventilator support because of this major response from the body. Other symptoms people get are gastrointestinal issues like nausea, maybe vomiting, some diarrhea, that loss of taste and sense of smell we're hearing about high fevers, so that second episode after the first couple of days of mild illness, then one or two days not feeling so bad, then when it comes roaring back, you get high fevers. Again, if you're in the 50% or less that are really having symptoms, and typically those are in the 102, 103 range with rigors, meaning shaking, fever, chills, really important then for people to seek medical attention at that point. Initially, unless it's emergent by telemedicine and then potentially in person if they're having shortness of breath. The other thing to keep in mind is aerosol spread um, that we hear a lot about. And what that means is when you look at dust particles in the air from the sunlight coming in a window, that's aerosolized particles. That's how easily this is spread and why this is so transmissible. And that spread through aerosols happens even before symptoms develop, just from talking. That's why we're starting to talk about masks. That's why it's spread as opposed to flu being spread typically from one person to maybe one or two more people. This is spread usually to four or five people from any individual that has it. Um, real quickly, the current outlook is, is that we need testing, number one. Epidemiology 101 dictates if you're dealing with an epidemic, find out who has it, isolate them, and then trace anyone they came into contact with. We missed the boat on that, but we need to at least be able to do that with healthcare workers so we know when to take them out of circulation and when they're safe to go back in. But we especially need antibody tests so we know who's protected. We're not even sure if antibodies for confer protection, but there have been some studies in macaque monkeys that just came out last week that showed the antibodies actually do confer protection for at least a week, and hopefully that pretends for longer. Abbott has a new test they're coming out with. They don't have a ton of availability of that test. So that's a big issue. Supply chain is a giant issue with this pandemic in terms of having enough reagents for the test, but hopefully they will get enough reagents and be able to have more antibody tests so that we will know not only if you have it, but when you're immune and then can go back as an essential worker to do your job. And that's what's most important for, for you all to pay attention is when is that antibody test available? When can I test people to know when they can go back to work? But with all testing, it's not 100%. So a lot of what Ashley and I have recommended be put in place is not just relying on testing, looking at the symptoms, looking at what else you can do in the event there are false negatives or false positives to keep everyone safe. And it's very important to recognize that A, testing isn't available and won't be available at the extent you'll ever want it. 
partly because all these supplies come out of China and all, and actually the, the supplies of most of these uh, antibody tests are out of China and Italy, you know, ironically. And number two, because sometimes tests aren't, aren't hundred um, percent. Last thing I'll just mention is in terms of how things are looking longer term, the vaccine is what ultimately we need to really prevent any of this from happening again. That's going to be 12 to 18 months away and 12 months is hyper aggressive. 18 months is a real hope and that's looking very promising. There's a ton of work being done as fast as possible, but it's not going to be before next fall, most likely, maybe next spring. Second thing to keep in mind, keep people talk about the seasonality of it, that's not guaranteed. We hope that this wanes a lot in the summer, but Brazil has a lot of infections in the thousands and that's very hot there. Florida had a lot of, a lot of infections. The other SARS virus actually kicked in in the summer. So we are not guaranteed that just because summer comes around, we're gonna be having a break from it. And the last thing I'll say before I move on is um, there's been a lot of treatment about, talk about treatment. We don't know the best treatment. There are a lot of studies under investigation. Hydroxychloroquine obviously has been in the news a lot. There's hope that that's helpful, maybe by itself, maybe compared, you know, and, and coupled with azithromycin, but the science isn't there yet to show for sure that that is the right treatment and it doesn't come without cost. It has side effects, it can cause eye problems. So that's something to keep an eye on, but we don't know for sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Spar. This is Ashley Kopp. I'm a registered dietitian. And what I wanted to do now is walk through the medical supervision uh, program, the features, um, what we're offering. So um, Dr. Spar and I both practice in personalized medicine. And um, I like to describe what we do uh, when we look at any situation, any patient, um, as turning on uh, location settings like you would use for Uber or Lyft. We really need to be able to meet you where you are. And that is the approach that we take in a medically supervised program. Um, so the most critical initial step is to really understand where you are. Our whole goal here is to identify your current resources and understand resource allocation and op help you optimize management of your resources um, throughout the program. And as Dr. Spar was just talking about, that duration may take us through, uh, and in most in cases will be taking us through, not just this initial pandemic experience, but also what does preparation and resource allocation look like um, as we anticipate um, additional outbreaks or even future viruses. So what does it mean with protocols, et cetera? I also want to mention that one of our colleagues is not on the phone today. Um, we have a mental health professional that is involved with us um, as well because uh, there's obviously such a core component of um, understanding how relationships, how an individual is experiencing um, their circumstances, whether as we get into discussions about quarantine or just um, any concerns that they have about their health, but also how that plays into their larger community, their family um, and other people uh, that are involved um, in, in their world. And so it's really important for us to bring that in. And I, I want to bring that up because there's also a distinction here. Dr. Spar and I are working in the medical supervised program as advisors to the entity. Um, so helping you again with resource um, allocation with management, we're not providing uh, personalized medical care for the operators or for your employees. Uh, that is a decision that can be made in each instance, whether or not the people that are supervising your program are providing that direct care. But of course, and as, our, as the lawyers uh, get involved in the discussion, uh, that will bring up uh, additional conversations and, and needs for uh, communication protocols, uh, et cetera, on that part. So what we do is a thorough assessment initially to understand where you are um, and then see, we can identify through that what the opportunities are that are available to us. So, um, you know, in the case where if we met you and you have already quarantined individuals or you've already decided to have individuals get tested um, or if you've already made certain decisions about people um, maybe doing changing their shift timing or who's working with whom that will be very helpful for us as well as understanding what the type of uh, operation uh, what their day-to-day -day looks like both in their on shift time as well as their off shift time and then we will be able to make recommendations uh, working collaboratively with you as well as with the legal team to understand what we think are the best next steps. Um, as Dr. Spar did an incredible job of communicating 
nothing is static in this environment. It's extremely dynamic. You know, one day we might hear that a state is experiencing, um, you know, maybe they've finally hit a plateau and the next day we actually hear that numbers are higher. We need to be able to make uh, recommendations and have adjustments for things that are occurring uh, in the moment, which is really where our implementation strategies come in. We will discuss strategies. Um, we will go through uh, during one of those strategies, for example, as he talked about was if we are doing testing or if testing isn't available, we may do medical screening. And when we do that medical screening, we'll be able to make recommendations to you about your resources, including uh, how many people we think, uh, you know, if, if it is the case of either quarantining or um, changing, uh, you know, how many people you have actually working so that you can leave some staff available for as reinforcements or rotation opportunities. Uh, things like that we will be working on, as well as implementation strategies around food sourcing, um, exercise, fitness, uh, you know, how are we going to help people maintain that mental health? A big part of that is the physical health, their sleep environments, <clears throat> excuse me. And so all of those pieces would come in uh, as strategies. Um, and then we work collectively with management uh, in collaboration with the legal team to advise and to consistently advise, uh, one of the things we found really valuable is in the immediate, in the initial phase, there may, might be a lot of conversations going on, but it's really valuable to have an ongoing regular check-in with management so that we can reinforce from a medical standpoint um, what is the backing for our decisions. Uh, if they choose to make other uh, decisions, that is you know, obviously a client uh, privilege, but uh, we definitely wanna be informing with that information. And then concluding, we're going to um, you know, have an ongoing oversight and adjustments um, throughout the program. And what that allows us to do is look at the protocols that we have in place to help employees understand the protocols, but also to allow them and hopefully give them timeframes for when we foresee the potential for adjustments. So an example of that might be if we were going to do some version of a quarantine, a home quarantine, a hotel quarantine, an on-site quarantine, um, there would be a time period where people would be under stricter quarantine rules and then uh, perhaps in a 14 day, after a 14 day time period when they've been quarantined, we can loosen those restrictions. And it's very important to manage their um, you know, their mental health and their uh, expectations um, uh, during that time period to let them know, hey, right now, this seems very strict and may even be uncomfortable, but please, you know, if everyone can be compliant during this time period, here is what that end piece looks like. And as well, you know, also having conversations about how long we think a quarantine may last. We all are dealing in this situation with these unknowns. And so we're not, you know, the adjustments may be ones where we're just saying, this is what we are going to be looking at this month or for these two weeks. And medically, we're able to break those things up into that time frame. Some of the, over, the additional oversight um, that uh, the medical supervision includes, um, we talked about temperature testing so that we can identify you know, how people are doing and really have hopefully the close, the, the soonest detection if there uh, is a concern. That likewise, that oversight can also be um, opening the door to have information if the individuals are comfortable sharing it with what is going on with family members so we can also understand how family uh, situations, if there are, are adjustments that are going to be needed in an operator's uh, availability based on a family situation, we would be finding that out as well. That goes more to the responsibilities of the mental health professional. And a key thing about the mental health professional uh, that I think is a really important one to manage uh, client expectations um, as well as to help in, uh, in advance and to, pretend, to present it in a manner where we're not, um, uh, we are not requiring therapy or mental health. Um, you know, we're not saying to somebody they have to start going into a program and working with someone. We describe it very much as a temperature check that we are, it's another aspect of our temperature check. We just need to have an ongoing check-in so that it's actually in favor of the operators that we can really understand and meet their needs uh, as best as possible um, and as soon as possible uh, by having that ongoing uh, temperature check. Um, so I think with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Andrea Gardner to talk a little bit more about how the implementation um, and, and start us into the legal side of the conversation. Thank you, Ashley. As Ashley and Kevin mentioned earlier, there are a range of measures that companies can take to support continued operations. 
because these are risk-based approaches, there is no one size fits all and the level of effort, expense and complexity to implement varies based on the measure chosen. Uh, workplace hygiene and social distancing measures take minimal effort and provide protections against infections at the most basic level. Examples include minimizing interaction between employees and maintaining the six feet of distance we've all heard about, splitting critical employees into different shifts and or different locations, and increasing the frequency and level of cleaning and disinfection in critical work areas. Uh, what we refer to as our advanced or special guidance requires an additional amount of effort but can go a long way to further minimize risk of exposure when employees are off shift or perhaps awaiting entrance into a quarantine. These more stringent measure, measures include remaining isolated when off shift if possible. This means that the essential, the essential employee should not be the family member doing the must run errands like going to the grocery store or the pharmacy. It also includes things such as symptom tracking measures, such as self-administered temperature checks twice daily for all family members and prior to departure for shift for the essential employee. Company provided alternative housing in a nearby hotel is another option, but one that adds complexity because it requires, among other things, that you need to secure a more public dwelling and it limits your control over contamination efforts. The on-site voluntary sequestration or quarantine approach adds the most complexity in planning because it requires, as uh, Ashley and Dr. Spar already discussed, strategic and coordinated effort between the company, the legal team, and the medical team. Issues that we have worked through with clients include lodging provisions such as RVs or mobile homes that are equipped with kitchens and showers, um, as Ashley just mentioned, the initial and ongoing medical screenings and wellness checks to track temperatures and assess mental health and stress levels, uh, sourcing and handling and distribution of food and other necessities or supplies, as well as family support. Finally, contingency planning or the development of risk scenarios that can identify potential gaps in existing plans given this unique nature of a pandemic's effect on personnel availability. One such scenario in which we have engaged with clients is an infected or working sick control room. This is where a certain number of employees become infected, but are essentially healthy enough to still perform their job functions and maintain continuity of operation. In the end, contingency planning will help you anticipate the logistical and operational challenges that could arise if the mitigation strategies you've already deployed become compromised. I'll turn it over to Kevin to take a little bit of a deeper dive. So Andrea described this range of measures that we've been talking about or alluding to that come with varying levels of effort and complexity to implement as she noted. And when, when this team started working with clients back in February, um, we were really, uh, some of this was sort of further ahead of the publicly available information. Thankfully, uh, if regrettably in some sense, um, some, some of this information has been more widely disseminated now and these practices have been adopted even if, whether they've been mandated by state or local government or whether companies have taken steps to implement them, which is, which is great. And I think hopefully we're seeing benefits from that um, societally. But what we've, I think, really learned is that there are better ways to do these things, more effective ways and less effective ways. And, and, that, and that comes down even to things like the, the manner in which uh, some of these recommendations and measures are being communicated to employees. I think we have found it's very helpful not just to, to develop and disseminate protocols or requirements for the workforce, but a certain amount of education really helps the employee population at issue understand the guidance. It helps with their effective implementation of the guidance and their, and their level of compliance. So a, a really well-rounded education program is something that costs very little and can provide significant benefits, whatever measures you're implementing. You know, some of these really are what, what we think of as no regrets measures. Um, the advanced guidance and education, employee screening and monitoring, self-isolation for at-risk employees. I mean, these things can be done uh, relatively easily. They do benefit from uh, medical input and supervision. 
But when you're drawing upon recognized authorities and providing guidance to employees about measures to be undertaken on their own, there's really no downside in going the extra mile. And here you're talking about whether they're working from home or whether they're coming to your facility, the, the more important their function, the more important it is that they stay healthy to continue that function. And um, this is, I think, a lot of sort of bang for the buck on these efforts to do them well. And they are effective in promoting the health outcomes that you're looking for in your workforce, we have seen, as compared to sort of the general population. Others, uh, as Andrea indicated, are more logistically, medically, and legally complex. In particular, the quarantine or sequestration, it may be called for in certain circumstances for certain companies, but you, it's really important to do it right to maximize the odds of a successful outcome. And the logistics are, we have learned, you know, quite challenging. And frankly, doing it wrong can be worse than not doing it, as, as one client aptly put it, what you really need to avoid is creating a sort of infected cruise ship full of your, your most essential personnel. So the quarantine is something that you, you really have to do well if you're going to do it to make sure that you don't actually introduce risks. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the program, um, some of the, the, the more detailed considerations about that. And I think as you're going to hear in a moment from our uh, legal colleagues, you know, it's, it's legally relevant that you would be in that instance structuring an environment for your workforce that is very different than the normal work environment that you've structured and operated for a long time. And so there are some special considerations in doing that that we're going to touch on kind of on a subject matter basis as we go along. I'll stop here before we pass it off to the rest of the lawyers just to see if Dr. Spar or Ashley Koff have any further thoughts you want to add on these sorts of range of measures that we've just outlined, and then we'll, then we'll move on to some of the legal issues. No, I would just reiterate what I said about given the fact that testing isn't really available to really be considering anybody. If, for example, what part of what we were, have been working on is rotating people in and out. So considering not only the people that are currently working, but the people that might need to replace the people that are currently working. So really keeping in mind, like when you look at those headcount calculations, somehow managing to track everybody that potentially could be needed over the next several months and include them in your tracking of symptoms or, or anything that you're trying to make, get a handle on who could be at risk. Yeah, and I just want to address um, one of the questions that came in uh, regarding what authority does the employer have to dictate what employees are doing off work or do you re recommend only providing guidance um, that is not required? I'm going to leave that to the legal individuals to talk about authority. I just want to make sure that uh, one of the pieces that I was communicating or that I didn't miscommunicate is that we do want to make sure that we are providing for and understanding what their off-shift goals and experiences usually are that help them maintain their health and their you know, happiness to a degree, et cetera. So part of the planning has been things, you know, such as as simple as, you know, having uh, where is your coffee maker available if you were someone off shift to you can't have the coffee, uh, the only available coffee in a place where you're far from, you know, so that might be a super specific. Uh, but likewise, you know, are there, you know, do you have good connectivity so that you can FaceTime with your children? We had individuals prepare some workout videos when people were not online, that there were workout videos that they could do uh, in a quarantine setting. Um, we have been, you know, working on that. Likewise, I was doing uh, another program for some medical professionals, and it was really, really important that we had foam rollers and proper bedding available because they were going to have such a short amount of time to sleep and also um, needed to be able to address their muscles. So the, the reason I was bringing it up is not, and again, I'm not talking about the authority piece, but it's really to understand that in that off work time period, because you are now going to be managing it, if you are putting, if you are taking over that time for someone, uh, you do want to provide guidance on how they can navigate that space, that time uh, in a way that will um, maintain their health and, and again, of course, their happiness. I'm going to uh, underscore one more detail that Andrea touched on at a high level. As far as measures short of an on-site quarantine, but for off-site, off-shift uh, measures that you that they could be taking. You know, if you've got really, and 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 I I will defer to Susan the question about uh, how much you can recommend versus dictate. With one 
company that we worked with, we advised that, uh, the, that their most critical personnel, if their family circumstances permit, uh, use a separate um, sleeping quarters and bathroom that was different from uh, the rest of the family members. And this was for presumed healthy individuals. Nobody's got any indication of uh, exposure or infection, but it's just an additional precaution recognizing that the, the individual employee is only one part of that household that's going out and doing things we don't know and can't control. And so sort of social distancing within the household environment. And similarly, with some clients that we've worked with, we've arranged for these self-isolation opportunities at local hotels. So if in, in one instance, uh, we had an employee who had a family member returning from an area that at that time was experiencing a surge, a country that was experiencing a surge in cases. And so they removed themselves from the home and moved into a hotel for two weeks until it was clear that the, the family member was not exhibiting symptoms and then they went back home, that sort of thing. So, you know, putting some thought into that ahead of time is helpful. Developing programs and communicating them to employees can help basically improve the odds. And it really is sort of a headcount numbers game to just make sure that you've got sufficient numbers of your critical personnel healthy and available for work when you need them. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to Susan to talk about some of the labor and employment issues. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Susan Wiltsey. Um, so as you've heard thus far in the program, um, I know you understand that we are, this, this team and others are assisting employers first with the management of these issues in their regular existing workforce but then secondarily in the sequestration or quarantine models and including recommendations as to how to decrease the likelihood of an employee, an essential employee, becoming infected in their personal life, which as we all know has gotten more challenging. Before I drill down a little bit on those, um, let me briefly talk about the, the legal landscape from a labor and employment standpoint. From the safety and health side of things, there are three authorities that, that we look to and, and necessarily must look to. Of course, the Occupational Safety and Health Act governs the requirements that an employer has to maintain safe and healthful work environment, a safe and healthful work environment for all of the, their employees. Additionally, the CDC, which we have all been you know, looking to daily, if not multiple times during the day, the CDC provides guidance to OSHA and to state and local health departments regarding these issues that we're discussing. But the CDC itself has very limited power. The CDC's power it relates exclusively to preventing individuals from entering the country or traveling state to state. Otherwise, they are simply a guidance agency and the implementors of that guidance from a legal risk standpoint it are OSHA and state and local health departments. The state and local health departments have police power to enforce quarantines, other infection controls, and the like. So when we're talking about how to manage employees um, in a quarantine situation or an isolation situation, all of these legal requirements come to bear. You must still, even if you're in a, in a situation where the employees were able to be tested before they went into isolation and all tested negative, um, as, as was spoken earlier, you have to assume for at least the first 14 days that those workers might still be contagious. So you must abide by all of the OSHA obligations to protect them from exposure to others who could be contaminated. And that includes following the CDC guidelines, which have largely been incorporated by OSHA. You also have to provide appropriate PPE that will depend on the circumstances. It will depend on the extent to which you have been able to implement engineering controls, um, which is really a formal way to impose social distance. And also, depending on your location, you have to look 
to precisely what your state and local health department has mandated. For example, a number of localities have now mandated wellness, daily wellness screens before employees interact with others. Those thus far are not true temperature checks, but are rather a, an inquiry about symptoms and contacts with others who might be exposed. Let me answer the specific question um, that was raised about the extent to which employers can mandate employees engage in control measures in their off-duty time. Really, I imagine all of you know, not so much can you do that from a legal perspective. You can't mandate that an employee does X, Y, or Z at home. But what you can do, and if you're, you're interested in, in following this protocol further, you must do, is provide guidance to those employees as to what they should be doing in the home in order to protect themselves from contagion. And then each morning or each time that that individual arrives for their shift, they are asked questions regarding their adherence to that protocol and the answers will depend on how that employee's workday is managed or whether they are sent home. And the only way that that realistically is going to work is if the work that that person is doing is um, financially compensated above the ordinary level. There has to be some financial carrot going on here. There's not really a stick other than you're going to be at home and not potentially not pay it at all. Speaking of pay, in a situation where you have made the decision to sequester essential employees and you are, you are managing them pursuant to a, to a medical protocol, maybe 12-hour shifts on, 12-hour shifts off, you must be very careful about how you um, structure their pay. There are significant pay legal obligations here. The Fair Labor Standards Act does have a specific provision about a work day that extends for 24 hours or more. The default position from the FLSA standpoint is that an employee must be paid all 24 hours unless by agreement the employer and the employee have sequestered eight hours for sleep time. And even then, if the employee is not able to get eight hours of carved out sleep time interrupted and is not able to sleep for at least five hours, that time is nevertheless compensable. On top of that, from an FLSA standpoint, you have the ordinary overtime obligations. And then on top of that, in a number of states, particularly California, you're looking at daily overtime rates, double time rates after 12 hours, double time rates after seven straight days of work. So must be mindful of all of the state and federal compensation issues. Paul? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, privacy and security issues. Uh, depending on the healthcare and working arrangement that you adopt for your critical infrastructure workforce, you may find um, that sensitive personal information and protected health, health information is flowing in and among employees and third parties in ways that are really not typical for your company. And this is to build on a point that Kevin mentioned earlier. And so you might find yourself collecting PII and PHI in the form of personal identifiers, prior medical history, test data, temperature measurements, uh, physical symptoms and diagnoses, state of mind, mental health issues, and so on resulting from uh, the arrangement that, that you've established. And so, um, you know, and this is the weird thing about this is that the normal systems you've established over the years to collect, transfer, communicate, process, store, uh, or destroy PII or PHI in, compl in compliance with federal and state law may not quite work for this arrangement. And so it's important to just think through um, a number of key questions for the different types of information that you're dealing with. Um, you know, one, what information needs to actually be collected? Who has a need to know it? Another question is how often and how quickly uh, do they need to see it? You know, what are the practical and operational factors to consider? How should the information be transferred? Uh, where and how should it be stored? 
uh, what you would do it over the phone, by email, by text, can you do it through a shared Google document? Who has uh, access to that document? How do you restrict it? How do you make sure that that's happening? What are the privacy and security risks associated with these? How do you mitigate those? And then of course, what legal regimes apply? HIPAA, of course, is uh, for, first it uh, comes to mind. But in, in this situation, you may find that um, in fact, the folks that are collecting uh, PHI might not actually be HIPAA covered entities. And so it just depends on what the arrangement is. You know, and if you're dealing with medical providers that are advising the company based on information uh, along the lines of what um, Ashley and Dr. Spar were talking about earlier, um, they may not be engaging in transactions that would trigger a HIPAA requirement. So it's important to think through those things. Um, the legal regime and the requirements may be lighter than you think. With this in mind, and as you think through these issues, uh, it's advisable to develop written information management protocols for each participant. And they can be pretty short. You can limit it to just a page or two uh, and then distribute them to the participants, review them together to make sure that everyone buys into them, whether they're operators, supervisors, medical professionals, and executives. It's also good to do a weekly check-in uh, for participants to make adjustments to these protocols as needed. You might need to do this more frequently at the beginning uh, as you sort of work through the issues and think through exactly how information is flowing. And then finally, it's, it's good to develop uh, consent forms or contracts addressing a number of issues. Um, and so whether it's the employment arrangement, uh, the voluntary nature of the arrangement, uh, the disclosures and use of personal and protected health information, uh, what are the parameters relating to notification of authorities about a COVID-19 diagnosis? Uh, what are the role of the professionals? Are they advising the company? Are they advising the company and also treating or advising the operators um, and if they're, if they're not, then what, they can, what can they do to treat the operator if he or she gets sick? So these are some of the things that, um, that are important to think through and the very, very arrangement specific uh, to your company, um, but it's just good to keep them in mind. None of it's rocket science, but it does require some planning and some deliberate intentional uh, sort of focus. And then I'll turn it over to the next person, which I think may be Lori on insurance. Hello everyone, Lori Masters. I'm in the insurance recovery group at Hunton and we represent policyholders and advise them on their insurance issues. Uh, I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about what we're seeing. Uh, and right now, um, as this slide says, um, really the frontline insurance that we are spending uh, almost, it seems sometimes uh, 18 to 24 hours addressing are the commercial property issues and specifically uh, the business interruption and related coverage issues. We also are starting to see some issues arise uh, with regard to insurance and um, employment type issues as Susan was talking about. And that would bring in potential workers compensation and employer liability policies perhaps employment practices liability policies if claims are made by employees for some kind of um, alleged discrimination or improper treatment that might be compensable under employment laws. There are some claims that have started to be filed that would be covered under commercial general liability policies for companies not taking adequate measures to protect people from COVID-19 exposures. And a number of actions have been filed against directors and officers. The early going there involves uh, cruise ships and their boards with the allegations that they have not properly disclosed risks that come out of COVID-19 and therefore there were uh, negative effects, of course, on stock price. It, it remains to be seen how effective some of these suits that have been filed will be. But one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that these policies in the liability space uh, cover your defense costs. And that can be sometimes where most of the or all of the action is, all the expenses are in addressing claims. Um, we're also seeing um, potentially applicable coverages here um, in other contexts, and then cancellation, that may not be a big issue for people on the call, uh, trade disruption policies or trade credit policies, and interesting coverage with the downturn. Of course, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, unanticipated claims that are being made on those kinds of policies. And as Paul just talking about, uh, and, and I think you see in the press, allegations that there are a lot of additional cyber incidents, uh, opportunistic efforts to take advantage of the crisis. So cyber insurance and that suite of coverages may come into play as well. So these are the kinds of things that you have um, 
in existence now that are in your insurance portfolio. So the next slide talks about the kinds of business interruption coverage that you may have. And uh, there are a number of these that might be applicable. Generally, of course, the COVID-19 issues um, across industries, but specifically in this context, uh, I wanted to talk about several of them that might cover some of the extra expenses that all the other speakers here have been talking about. So your business interruption, your contingent business up interruption coverages, all of these really uh, with the possible exp uh, extra expense coverage, they're covering your loss of business income. And that may not be as much of a consideration uh, directly for us on this call. It's certainly a consideration for many of our clients, but things that uh, may be important to consider under the kinds of coverages are the things that are listed here under um, business interruption and contingent business interruption. The extra expense coverage, for example, that covers expenses that you are incurring because it could be damage to other people, an interruption to other people, it could be interruption to your business. It covers the extra expenses that you're incurring as a result of the interruption. A similar coverage is the preservation of property or sue and labor coverage. Um, so these things uh, could cover a number of the kinds of expenses that other speakers have been talking about the extra expenses that you're incurring because of sequestering people, the housing costs that Paul talked about, um, the privacy and data protocols and other measures that you may put into place to protect privacy, the contingency planning, uh, the medical check-ins, the expenses to reduce risk. These would all be things that could be considered extra expenses and covered under these kinds of coverages. And then there are these other specific coverages that might apply contamination, communicable disease cover, and civil authority that applies to pay for expenses arising out of government orders. And of course, there's these two others at the end which might be applicable, but probably uh, less so in this context, service interruption and ingress egress. So things that I wanted to mention for policyholders to consider, for you all to consider at this point in time, if you think you may have business interruption coverage, any of those that I just talked about, um, now is the time, I would say, to consider giving notice. There are two kinds of notice that we think about in the insurance field. Notice circumstances, which is, as it indicates, I think, any circumstances that you think might lead to a claim. All of us, that's all we're talking about is COVID-19. So if there's any consideration of potentially uh, wanting to make a claim for business interruption type coverages, now is the time to at least give a notice of circumstances. And then if you decide to proceed with a claim, of course, give a specific notice of claim. Th those two notices might collapse into the same thing, but if you haven't crossed the bridge about whether you might want to make a claim under your insurance, now is the time to be thinking about at least putting uh, carriers on notice, insurance companies on notice of circumstances. All it is is a letter, it doesn't take much, but it preserves your right to coverage and potentially uh, uh, avoids uh, a defense to coverage by the insurers. Uh, there are timing deadlines to consider. So again, if, if I know there are many, many things that we're all dealing with, but if you think that insurance might be an angle to pursue here, um, sometimes, well, now is, is the time to do it uh, because a lot of these policies include deadlines for submitting proofs of loss or if there were to be litigation, suit limitation provisions. All of these are considered contractual statutes of limitation. Some of them are very short. The proof of loss deadlines might require 90 days from when you know there's a claim query what that means in this context or when 90 days from when you give notice. So that clock might be ticking. They can be extended by agreement, but they need to be addressed or they can preclude coverage. And one other thing that I wanted to throw out there, I've been talking about the insurance that you may already have, but everyone's going to be facing renewals coming up and um, it's going to be a very challenging environment to renew insurance coverage in, I would say, any time in the next year. But certainly, if you have renewals, um, June, July, August, um, into the 
early to mid fall. These will be extremely challenging. I would start now thinking about talking to your broker and thinking about uh, how uh, those discussions should proceed to renew the coverages you have in place. And it's clear in the insurance press that there will be a lot of additional provisions that insurers are going to want to put on to renewals, uh, renewed coverages or purchases of new coverages in light of COVID-19. These are not always fully disclosed in my experience, so it's really important to be on the lookout for them, to review and understand your current coverage as well, because if they're reducing coverages, that should be part of the negotiation and the pricing of the renewed coverage. So these are all things to start factoring into the analysis now. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next person. So um, I mentioned earlier, we take a little deeper dive on this topic. It's sort of the most extensive of the different programs or measures that we've, uh, we've talked about. So as we've noted, as we've gone along here, we've consulted and worked with a number of companies that have taken steps to establish some sort of a sequestration or quarantine program for essential personnel, or if they haven't yet taken steps in that direction, they're, they're sort of doing some initial preparations to be ready to do show should, um, should they conclude that conditions warrant. We worked extensively with one company in particular that we represented to establish what we understand to be the first such program in the country in response to this outbreak and we're engaged with several others who are sort of in, in process. So a couple of key points from our learnings to share. We've noted this earlier, but these programs are logistically, medically, and legally complex. There, I think in our view, is no one right way to do something like this because it really does need to be tailored to your own company's role and mission, your workforce needs and your, your workforce headcount, your specific facilities and resources and other considerations that would be unique to your organization. So that's one key point. I think it's also important to stress that a sequestration or quarantine is absolutely not the only right approach to managing mission critical workforce. As we've been discussing all along, there are a range of advisable measures sort of on a continuum. Um, and in some cases, depending upon your circumstances, a sequestration or quarantine may not even be advisable for various organizational reasons or circumstances. To reiterate, as we, as we discussed earlier, doing something like this wrong can be worse than not doing it at all. So all of those things need to be taken into consideration if you're thinking about these types of measures. There are, I'm just gonna tick through these quickly as sort of an indicative list of the sorts of issues to be considered and worked out, you know, how to arrange uh, living accommodations, how to medically screen and select for entry into quarantine, how to process the people and materials coming into the quarantined environment, how to provide food service during the term of the quarantine, how to handle the entry of unquarantined individuals into the quarantined environment when necessary. So you know, uh, critical IT or maintenance uh, personnel that are not in the quarantine but may have reason to have to come in, wage and hour considerations, which we've touched upon, provision of medical support, both medical supervision of the program itself, and then continued care for the quarantined individuals, uh, as well as plans for emergency medical services for quarantined individuals. There are uh, a host of issues, as Paul discussed, about the handling of individual healthcare information in an environment very different than what you're used to operating in. This point is, I think, hard to overstate. The importance of advanced hygiene and social distancing protocols inside the quarantine. You have to avoid a false sense of security that could create conditions that are exactly those you're looking to avoid. Um, so that's one that requires a lot of attention from management uh, to, to sort of do this right. You need preparations for isolation within the quarantine. If somebody starts to exhibit symptoms of COVID-19 or any other sort of infectious disease scenario where you need to be able to isolate them from the other quarantined individuals or possibly make decisions about how, to, how and when to pull them out of quarantine. We talked about plans for rotation into and out of quarantine, depending upon the duration of the program, you may need a rotation schedule. And then Ashley talked about sort of health and wellness initiatives that are for both the, the benefit of the quarantined individuals, but also their families. And uh, as Lori just discussed, a careful review of your insurance policies, 
of specifically in this instance to make sure that you have the coverages you need where you're departing from your normal business operations, you've got people living on site, other considerations that you, you need to quickly review to make sure that all those things are covered under your policies or that you can make adjustments to get them covered. So I'll briefly ask for any thoughts from the other panelists on that litany of considerations for a quarantine or sequestration program. And then um, I think we'd like to uh, turn to any questions that folks who are listening to the program might have for the panel. Hi, this is Susan. It was a question that came in on the Q&A about how to manage PPE given the supply chain issues. Um, and the answer to that is First is there's not a perfect answer, but on the CDC website, there is a really good next best list. If you can't get an N95, consider these resources from these six countries. If you can't find this, try this as, as a next step. I think from an OSHA compliance standpoint, it's important to walk through that hierarchy um, and see if you're able to get the supplies that you need that way. Um, otherwise, a number of our clients have had success working directly with the local health department where their facility is located to um, talk through alternatives. For example, surgical mask with a face shield instead of an N95, perhaps adding in some, some engineering controls, splash guards and the like, in order to just get by with surgical masks when an N95 would otherwise be the right PPE. I've found that local health, if you can get through to them, they've really thought through a lot of those issues and can be helpful. And from an OSHA compliance standpoint, if local public health told you something was protective, that's a good defense. Following up on some of those observations about working with local public health officials or local government officials, whether it's securing access uh, to those types of materials or access to testing, which we all know can be difficult at times, I think it helps to work through your external affairs people to, you know, if you're not already in sort of a good working relationship with these relevant authorities to explain the significance of your company's operations. You know, it's one thing if some businesses are unable to continue functioning. Um, I think the folks focused in on this conversation are businesses that um, are more essential than average, but sometimes that requires some explaining. So we've had that experience, having to go to local or state government and also local public health officials to sort of explain who we are, what we do, and why we need some special consideration to keep operating. Just real quick, and I, and I don't think I did a great job explaining it. That's what I was saying about the influenza-like illness monitoring. So some of you may be not in states that are having a big peak of this current pandemic. And so if you do get a hold of your public health officials where you are, you can ask them to give you a heads up on what they're seeing coming down the line because the data is too late to respond. And that's where this surveillance program that all public health departments have in place nationwide to look at influenza-like illness has been shown to be helpful to predict a couple weeks before the numbers start to climb of actual infections when it's looking like that's gonna be a hot spot. So that's exa exactly like Kevin said, if you say, look, I need to know what you're seeing when you're seeing it, they have to give you that information. I want to shift gears for a second to going back to the um, sequestration and quarantine and also recognizing that there are degrees of this that we can use as, as a strategic tool for the managing of the workflow. So part of it may be we, we are doing, you know, quarantines or sequestration for individuals as it, the ability to bring them into a quarantine location or to keep them available. You know, so I think that's one point for consideration. And the question that came up about educating employees um, as opposed to providing guidance, any recommendations on how to do this. I think this is a critically essential part of the communication. And the interesting thing when I'm talking about educating employees, I'm also going to say that that starts with the very top of the employer chain, um, all the way at the highest level of management. One of the things that we know is that there is ongoing information coming from all sorts of different sources uh, in this crisis at a very quick pace. So one of the most important things to do is to have a communications 
plan in place that distributes um, the perspective and the point of view of your medical team uh, and allows for, again, uh, we're not even doing things in print. We're doing them uh, where we are having conversations with management. We're having conversations with family members. We're having conversations with operators where we can ask their questions, where you can hear from myself and Dr. Spar and our colleague on the mental health side um, so that you're getting up-to-date information. Um, but one of the reasons for not putting it in print is that a lot of the information may have changed from the time that we agree to it in print and, and then you know, have it uh, distributed. So I think it's important for absolutely to be providing that education or as opposed to just providing guidance. Um, the other part of it is uh, the education piece um, in anything from a medical standpoint, when someone understands either how their body is working or how the virus is working, then compliance is significantly elevated. So if I just tell you to you know, wipe your feet um, when you come in or wipe down your keys and uh, things like that or wipe the outsides of packages, um, I may not be understanding why I'm asking for that. But if I explain, hey, that the virus, this particular virus, as we see it right now, has a potential to survive on plastic for um, three days. Uh, and that means that if somebody sneezed on the package that you brought, you know, sneezed within the six feet at the grocery store and you brought that package home and you're now putting it on your counter, um, that increases your risk. So the reason I'm asking you to wipe down your packages outside or the reason we're doing the wipe down outside of the quarantine is to reduce the likelihood of that experience, you're going to have a better compliance rate. So I think the, the difference between providing education and guidance is that your education has to be extremely pragmatic. Um, we had conversations about things like, you know, can people in a home be sharing vitamins? Well, to me, it's a real question of if you're putting your hands and your fingers inside of the vitamins, if I'm, you know, if I'm dealing with the employee, then I'm trying to have them have their own stuff as opposed to if I'm having the individual, you know, if we're, um, as opposed to family sharing, right? Um, and a question like that just actually recently came up where someone said, hey, we've been in this quarantine for a period of uh, two weeks. We're allowing a loosening of the restrictions. Can we go to family style meals? Well, there's no argument against family style meal at this point for the COVID virus, but I'm trying to also in a quarantine situation, minimize the risk of just spreading germs, which can just make my employees sick if somebody has, um, something non-COVID related. So I want to then go ahead and explain there as opposed to just having guidance on, um, you know, family meals will be provided, family style meals can be provided after day 14. I went in and explained why we're not going to do that. Um, but I gave a couple of idea, you know, comments on everyone can now use the same uh, coffee pot if they're pouring it into their own cups. You know, so we actually have to get very specific. So that's what I meant um, on the education side. And I want to bring in legal. I'll just give a um, sort of a transition. Uh, there's a question that came up asking, saying, given that the EEOC guidance on limited on the limited questions employers can ask employees about symptoms, and given that many people are asymptomatic but still contagious, how do we effectively manage critical workforces and ensure those with UL medical conditions are not exposed? So I'm going to actually ask Dr. Spar to comment on this. This was a core part of our guidance. Then I'm going to invite legal in to have a conversation um, about the legal side of sharing of this information. But Dr. Spar, if you want to comment on how we were asking and screening them medically, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, like I said, it's important to know, number one, that the tests aren't 100% accurate, even if you have availability of testing. And so to know what the right questions are to ask who's at risk in this specific pandemic. And some of those are the questions such as tracking temperature, have there been any fevers at all, any feverishness, any sense of achiness, any sense of dry cough, any sense of fatigue, any of those loss of taste or smell, um, or any gastrointestinal issues. And having that on record is really helpful to know who to monitor more closely and maybe keep separate from everybody else that's going into quarantine. And this is Susan, from a legal standpoint, um, the questioner has the line of demarcation exactly correct. You may ask almost any question, well, any question that you want that is related to exposure or contagion likelihood of COVID of your workers, but you cannot ask questions about the underlying medical conditions that might make them more vulnerable to a severe outcome 
from COVID-19 contagion. There isn't a perfect way to navigate that. Um, one of the tools that we're recommending is if you are going into an isolation or sequestration um, scenario, um, best first step would be to ask for volunteers and put in that query for volunteers that they you recommend that those who have underlying medical conditions that make them particularly susceptible not volunteer. I think that is a safe way to um, separate out those who, who might be more at risk from others, but there isn't a perfect solution. Some of our clients have gone ahead and taken the risk and, and asked directly about underlying medical conditions, but I think we need to be clear that that is a via, still remains a violation of the ADA. Susan, while you have the mic, uh, we've got another question about uh, requiring employees to wear uh, personal protective equipment. You want to field that one? Sure, of course. Um, so as, as all of you who work with unionized workforces know, um, you are able to implement legal requirements without bargaining with the union, although you may have an a obligation to bargain over the effects of those decisions. So the first thing that I would recommend is that you conduct an analysis with your attorneys who, may, who advise you on union issues as to whether or not the, the PPE that you were required would be legally required under OSHA in order to protect your workers. Um, if the answer to that is yes, then you should be able to go ahead and implement that PPE obligation, but it's always a best practice to include the union in those discussions so that can happen hopefully as seamlessly as possible. And we've got another question I'm going to let you read on the labor and employment front. While you do that, I want to sort of add to and underscore one thing that Ashley said. It's been really interesting to see how the, the education piece has done exactly what she described. It just it, it uh, has enhanced compliance, understanding, and helping drive the, the behaviors and outcome that you're looking for. I would also add that I think it had a beneficial impact on morale in the employee population to be directly involved in uh, what's being done to protect them and to protect, you know, continued company operations. Most of them are pretty mission oriented type people. In a couple of instances, we had Dr. Spar and Ashley do direct briefings and Q&A with, um, with groups of employees and they did sort of a similar version to what they did here, some, some basic education in the virology and some of why these recommendations are, are, are what they are and how they work. And uh, I, I think that was very well received by the employees. And the other thing that we've done was to work with effective employees in crafting some of the guidance. So, you know, they're the ones on the front lines doing these functions and learning from them what they need to continue doing them well you know, it may be that if, if management and some outside consultants sat down and drew up some guidelines, we would overlook things that are easy to address because they just are, but we don't know to address them because we don't work and live in, in that work environment. So um, engaging, if not all of those employees, some selected representatives from the workforce can be really effective in making these things work and making them go over well with the affected employees. And Susan, with that, if you've got an answer to this next yeah. question about temperature screens, I'll hand it back to you. You bet. So the question for those of you who aren't looking at the Q&A is, what do we do when customers ask for the temperature readings of the staff we screen? EEOC guidance says we need to treat as medical record under the ADA, which prohibits disclosure. So the answer to the first question is, if you are temperature screening, you tell your customers that you're temperature screening and no one with a temperature over 100.4 or whatever cutoff you're using has been permitted to come to work. I certainly don't think your customers are entitled to any information beyond that. As the questioner points out, the EEOC guidance says that the temperature check is permitted, but it's a medical record under the ADA. And then without helping the regulated community in the least, the EEOC doesn't tell us how we're supposed to take the, these temperatures in a manner that preserves the confidentiality. Um, but, the, but the answer, the answer to, that to that is that employers should 
screen for temperatures in a way that permits the person who is not being allowed to enter the workplace to leave discreetly. That means doing it, many of our clients are using tents, some are going to their cars. Um, you, you simply can't let others see that that person has been rejected because of their temperature from entering the workplace. Susan, I think we got another one for you here about an employee who refuses to come to work and wants to take leave during the COVID-19 outbreak, asserting that they have a relevant underlying health condition. So this is very challenging, um, or I'm sure the questioner knows that because there isn't a perfect answer, right? Um, the perfect answer a month ago was, well, if you have an underlying health condition that makes it medically um, ill-advised for you to come to work, give us a doctor's note and stay home on sick leave. When you know many of, of our clients and many of you in the audience are probably having the equivalent of a sick out where employees are simply refusing to come at all. Um, I, I don't think that you can be quite so nice as to say, oh, just stay home, honey. Um, we don't need a medical document. So um, I'm urging some aggression in that. Um, one way to do it is to put together a document that you give to your employee who who's claims that they can't come to work and has them a test not, you know, not notarized, but a test that they have an underlying medical condition. They've been advised by their physician not to come to work and that when conditions improve, they will give you appropriate medical documentation substantiating their representations about their health. And then if they don't do that, then you can handle that as a disciplinary matter or sometimes even as a waged theft situation where they have taken sick leave. There's a related cluster of questions around vendors and service providers on contract that are failing to perform under the existing contracts. And uh, we don't have our procurement and outsourcing group on the phone with us here today, but they've uh, not surprisingly been, been fielding a, an avalanche of questions along those lines. And there are different types of considerations and tools there, but um, it's, it's a, a prominent question right now with vendors and service providers failing to show up to do what they've contracted to do, alleging impossibility or force majeure or otherwise. So um, common issue that companies are dealing with. Um, and Kevin, it looks like the last question is also a labor and employment question. The question is for an employer with under 500 employees who mandate employee quarantine due to possible exposure, is there a requirement to pay those employees for the recommended 14 day quarantine period? And the answer is yes, if you're covered by the FFCRA and if you're under 500 and you don't otherwise fall into one of the exceptions, then you would need to pay um, any employee that has been mandated to be quarantined the emergency paid sick leave that is um, provided for under the FFCRA. And then as probably all or most of you know, you can recoup some or all of that payment through tax credits. So I think that brings us to the end of our list of questions and we're getting close to uh, the uh, end of our program here. So I'll thank everyone who uh, dialed in uh, to participate today and each of my colleagues here on the panel, especially our medical uh, team members, Dr. Miles Spar and Ashley Koff. Thank you for participating today. So if there are other individual questions that you have about your organization, things that you're working through with your workforce management, our contact information here is available on this last slide, which will be available for anybody who participated and um, we can also put you in touch with Dr. Spar and Ashley Koff if the questions um, or inquiries are directed toward them. So thanks everybody for participating today. Stay well and if we can help working through these issues, let us know.